ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dinner time is here. That's right, we're talking Season 1, Episode 12 of Hannibal on Dish by Dish. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from an airplane sitting in the Dulles airport. <laughs> and I just woke up here. This is the Dish by Dish podcast, a Hannibal rewatch project brought to you by Kill by Kill. And uh, as always, there is only one person I trust that if I'm going to have several fantasies, about how she helped lure uh, co-eds to their deaths with her dad, I'll be sure to um, have it while sitting in that very same airplane. And I'm not really sure how I got there. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I, I don't know how you got there, but you are definitely very sweaty while doing so. Oh, man, gloriously sweaty. I don't know what I like more. Do I like Will when he's sweaty in bed wearing just random grays and browns? <laughs> or do I like him sweaty in street clothes? I don't know. Uh, I think sweaty in street clothes is is, is creepier. It, it well because, because we've all we've all like, you know, we we've, we've all been like, you know, you know, sweaty in our night like, clothes if we're sick or sure. you know, and 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 <laughs> Yeah, but when you're just kind of stumbling around like, <laughs> like dressing your normal clothes, like, like, you know, just sweat just like exploding out of your forehead. People are going to kind of cringe away from you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got I'm one of those people that if my faucet turns on, it has a real hard time turning. <laughs> you're like Ted Stryker. <laughs> yeah, I am. I literally am. It's sad. And I don't think I became that way until I turned 30. And then all of a sudden my body said, guess what? This is new, but you're going to love it. When you start to sweat, you can't stop sweating. And it doesn't matter if it's just hot or you're just nervous. You like to sweat. It's like, like uh, it's like the John Mulaney thing. It, it's like I was sitting in something and it was me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I keep adding me to it. <laughs> it's uh, not my finest feature and probably why I am not continuing in that tradition of my 20s of performing in community theater or on stage. Because I would just be a sweaty mess now if I tried to do it. You got this like horrible like pit stains. And stuff oh, like yes, <laughs> and I mean you you've heard I'm like a Chanty Canty doll who's yanking my own string here. So like when I would get on stage to perform, like would just yap out of my mouth constantly. But then I'm the sweaty guy doing. <laughs> And then that was my presentation. Like that was me at star level. Was that? And, and it's, well, you know, you could have got away with that in the eighties. So everybody would just assume you were on cocaine. Yeah, well, it's fashionable. Uh, you know, now. Have I mean, you ever uh, watched old performance performance footage of, of Robin Williams? That shit's yeah. frightening. Oh my god! Like his veins are bulging out of his forearms. <laughs> just, I, at one point, it was okay to be that. And like that visibly high, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's a rarity these days. Although, um, I, I we're, we seem to subtly be shunning some of these people. Like Johnny Depp has now been resigned. To he's just, had a fun high. Yeah, he's like the mean asshole high. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. The the stuff that came out of his fucking fingertips. That revealed in his very tired. <laughs> this is <laughs> hi. This is a Hannibal podcast. <laughs> Well, you gird yourself because we are going to bring on the 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 ire of the Johnny Depp fandom. Uh, but half of them are Russian bots. I don't. I, I don't like. They all have the same fucking move. Like they're all they are like the election truthers. It's all the same bullshit where they're just constantly litigating something that doesn't hold up in court. Like it's evidence. What are we talking about again? Oh, yeah. Hannibal. The television show. The excellent television show. Hannibal. Which, which Johnny Depp has not starred on. No, nor will he ever if I have anything to do with it. And let's start off with... is Am I in the middle of World War fucking 2? That plane could not be lower to the ground. <laughs> 
my desk is rattling. <laughs> you're, be, you're being dive bombed. Uh, we do not live that close to an airport. I don't. I don't that's know always, that's that's always disconcerting. That. You get the low flying planes. Like, we're going to stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's always, I think we're in a lane for prop airplanes ah. uh, as opposed to like. So, so you've got like a little old tiny flying man up there? That's right. <laughs> like misbegotten World War II flyers or, or planes that go, are still held up by the gremlins that are holding onto the wings. Gonna go get that bug of root beer? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, what were we talking about again? Hannibal. Okay, so let's uh, so focus. Hannibal. This particular episode, episode twelve, relevantes, 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 reveals, reveal, revealers, relevantes. Costa. I, I don't know. You might as well call it revelations because it's kind of what happens in this episode. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but it's like a Frenchy kind of word. It's a very Frenchy kind of word, which apparently at one point was a type of entree. So perhaps you would uh, take off the cloche, you know, to reveal what was inside. Who's to say? My research came up uh, uh, sad and short. That being said, this particular episode of Hannibal has one of the most horrific deaths See? Yeah, this goes, this goes, this goes full Final Destination. <laughs> that's, that's but one. final, but like Final Destination, if like they like the, all those ones are very sharp and short, you know, like oopsie, blam. This one is a very short moment, elongated, to where you're seeing someone scream and inhaling fire. That is. Uh, nightmarish. It might be the most horrific on-screen death seen in this show so far, and that is saying something. Yeah, I'll I'll agree with you. It's it's not gory like the other ones are, but it's just like it's one of the ones you think about. You're like, oh dear God. Yes, it reminded me personally of the Metapod sequence in Prometheus, the good part of Prometheus. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, are you talking about um uh uh the second that was the one after that, the follow up one. Um uh God when, No, it's when it's when she 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 discover the main scientist lady who was the girl with the dragon tattoo. She discovers that she's got some sort of alien. Oh, thing oh, oh, her. okay. So because I know there in um in the second one, uh the follow up for me that there was somebody who like died in a fire in her capsule. Oh, 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 oh. No. I, I don't remember that well enough. <laughs> I It's kind of something I remember um, some sexual fluting between robots, but everything else in that I... <laughs> I mean, really, remember. what else matters? <laughs> <laughs> when it comes down, like, what do you love about uh, that alien covenant? I don't know, sexual fluting? That's that's my bag. Just Michael Fassbender just eye-boning himself. <laughs> <laughs> and who can blame him? Um, but... Uh, this is got because she's trapped inside this oxygen compartment, and the very and it's, it's, it's trying she, and and you know n- not that anybody uh, well, there are some movie and TV characters who deserve such a fate, but yeah. she really doesn't. No, I mean she's not. She's completely out of control of what happened to her, and she's even though that she knows supposedly what she did, she very. Um, quickly tells Will when they have their conversation, I I know what I did, but I don't want to remember what I did. And Jesus fucking Hasselhoff Christ. (laughs) Is World War 3 starting? And by 3, I mean like 2.5 because there was a time warp and zeros are hovering over Long Beach? What the fuck is going on? Jeez, I, this is it circling now? <laughs> <laughs> it, there's if you're going from one place to the other, the sound should disappear, but it it's getting louder. Everyone, duck! Here comes in, the aircraft. Are they landing in your yard? 
fucking maverick is up there <laughs> har haring at me now. <laughs> Make sure you leave all this in. This is gold. <laughs> <laughs> is it? We we've talked about Hannibal for forty five seconds. <laughs> We're eleven minutes into this. <laughs> Even for us, this is this is a lot of not talking about Hannibal. Okay. Yeah, she she doesn't deserve what's happening to her. But in essence, I think it's an encapsulation of what ultimately we're seeing from Hannibal in these in these circumstances. And that is he wants to see what will happen next. Like it's if like, he just puts a bunch of things in play, what will happen? It's like Bravo, what will happen? Watch what happens next. <laughs> That's right. Uh, somehow the airplane turned on my television. Oh, um, God, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> We may be haunted. <laughs> we may be haunted by an aircraft ghost. Wasn't there one, an aircraft ghost in Scooby-Doo? Who I think there say? was, yeah. Yeah. What the fuck was I talking about? We're talking about oh. uh, Georgia. Georgia. I haven't even mentioned, yeah, it was Georgia. And we haven't bro. even mentioned her name. Yeah. Poor Georgia. Yeah, she is healing. I guess you, you could you see that. You know, her, her, you know, her face looks better. She's still got this weird, shriveled old man arm. Yeah, well, I mean, she's got like a, a an arm condom on to replace the skin that fell off in Will's hand. Just, she got degloved <laughs> in her first episode, this poor girl. And yet, her hair looks wonderful. Yeah, that, os- that oxygen treatment is, 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 is doing wonders for her. <laughs> it's true. Do you think it's VO5 and oxygen? Do you think it's a combo? It must be. It must be the best Brazilian blowout you can really get is to lay on your side constantly in an oxygen chamber. In an oxygen chamber that is attended by nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's ever near this thing. People could just walk in eat? and talk to her. Will's going to pressing buttons like he's trying to make microwave <laughs> popcorn. And you know, evidently Hannibal was able to open the damn thing up and put a comb in there. Yeah, while she was asleep, I would just oh, come and on. take the take the bracelet off that she's supposed to be wearing that keeps her from being electrocuted. <laughs> I love these understaffed hospitals and these kinds of things. Love them. I love yeah. them. No, no one roams these hallways because they didn't catch Hannibal when he was wearing his his uh, very tailored uh, plastic serial killer suit last time. And no one noticed him coming in or out of this particular room to give her a comb so she can blow up real good. I, I, you know what? I, once again, it's Hannibal. It's not reality. It's not reality. No, 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 no. But she blows up real good. And I think this sets up something that we see uh, throughout play throughout this episode. And I think is setting up season two, which is, Hannibal likes to put things in motion simply to see how they will play. Now, it also puts himself in danger, but I kind of think the danger is something he gets off on. Well, yeah, and also because he's just really, really good at talking himself out of things, and and you know he he's very glib, and and you know this is what he does for a living. He tells people yeah. what they want to hear. Um, speaking of talking and hearing what they want to hear, uh, Freddie Lowndes. Um, I think breaking all have... breaking all sort of journalistic integrity. <laughs> Man, she's like a dog with a bone when it comes to the Will Graham thing. But at the very least, I think I'm sort of getting why she's so pissed off, in that she believes that Will Graham has a license to kill that he's basically a serial killer protected by the state is her ongoing theory, even though he's only been linked really to one fishier murder, but I guess bodies are piling up around him. He has fired off a couple guns, including last episode when he shot a guy just for standing outside of a house. (laughs) <laughs> but does she but you know, does she care that he's allowed to do that because of moralistic reasons or because he's getting in the way of her scoop somehow i i i like both theories i'm not sure which one is correct 
I mean, certainly the getting in the way of her coverage of serial killers is tenuous. It feels petty. It doesn't, it, I, you know, I like it <laughs> because that's how it kind of comes across before she starts like talking about it out loud. But I, I do think that she um, believes that she's in the same way that certain other characters have been set up to think like I could be Will Graham. I could, I could hunt down serial killers just with my mind. She's one of those people. And I think it pisses her off that she has to do it from the lowly standpoint of a website. Whereas Will Graham gets the full faith and badge and gun from the FBI. So sort of like a, uh, you know, you you refuse to acknowledge that we're you, know, you and I we're we're we're, you know, we're very much alike. Yes, yes, and holy fuck, is that plane coming back? Oh my god, what is happening in my house? <laughs> <laughs> there there have been no planes all day, but you know, six o'clock runs around. You turn on a microphone and recording equipment, plane number three. David, I can hear that. Wow. <laughs> it's the same plane. I swear to God. It is circling us like a police helicopter. Um, what have you done? I don't know. <laughs> what Becky I've done, done. is I've, I've denigrated the good name of Freddie Lowndes. I was going to say Becky, um, Becky knocked over a local convenience store. <laughs> Good for her getting out there and doing things. Listen, just, I don't want to hold her back. She just looks so innocent, you know? I mean, she totally yeah. could get away with it. And no one ever suspects. Um, <laughs> the nice blonde lady. Yeah. Uh, one time we were we were at the San Diego Zoo, and um, they announced that, all right, hold on, because you're gonna, you're about to see something you've never seen before and you'll never see it coming. The pygmy hippopotamus. And the guy in front of us leaned over to their kid and said, yeah, you never see a pygmy hippopotamus. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> You're a pygmy hippopotamus expert? <laughs> Speaking of pygmy hippopotamus, hippopotami, what we don't suspect or how the, the FBI could never suspect is that all the copycat murders that we have seen to this point, one uh, approximating the Minnesota Shrike, another one also approximating the Minnesota Shrike, even while the FBI were in town. Uh, they're also attributing the guy that Abigail knifed in the gut who accused her of murder. Turns out she's totes in on it, y'all. And has uh, dipped and dabbed here and there uh, as like a in and out of the Chesapeake Ripper thing. So up until this point, no one has really linked those crimes outside of us as the audience. But all of a sudden, Will's like, hey, guess what? All these crimes that are copycats of other killers, one killer. And, yeah, and, and finally, at, and finally, everybody looks at him like, say what? <laughs> After like 12 episodes of him just saying the craziest shit. Yes. Yeah, like, this, this is the breaking point for people is that they're all connected. Yes. And because it sounds like a conspiracy theory. And to the point where at one point, Jack's like, I want you to start hunting down physical evidence and timelines and tickets and track people's movements. And they're like, yay, real work. We're not just thinking outside the box and saying whatever's on the top of our heads. Like, nope, time to find evidence, everybody. And the evidence they find uh, links Abigail to the Minnesota Shrike murders in that she has been part of the hunt or as she tells will in his what we learned to be a fantasy later on or is it how much of that scene in the elk lodge is fa is in his head and how much of it was real I, I, yeah it, it was that's very confusing because somehow he ended up back up on that plane even though, even though Abigail says that she she left him behind at the cabin, 
I'm being haunted by this plane, Gina. It won't go away. <laughs> We've never had a plane invasion of this type before. And um, is there an air show happening? Just one plane. On a Thursday night? That seems like not a good idea. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I'm not sure how, uh, you know, uh, at one point he goes away and she leaves because later she shows up at her old house and Hannibal is there. And he's like, where did you leave will? And she's like, well, I didn't feel safe with them. We were up at the hunting cabin together. So that part of that actually happened. Obviously he didn't like shove her on to, to, you know, antlers. But the rest of it happened, and then he just went bye bye time. I mean, yeah. At what point did it, did it, did it you know kind of clock over from you know stuff that was actually happening to stuff that wasn't actually happening? Yeah, because that whole sequence was: are you the are you the hunter or the fisher? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Will, for God's sake. <laughs> Don't be a creepy old guy traveling with a young woman. No one wants to see that. Um, But he quickly puts two and two together, which is an interesting scenario because he has been compromised by Hannibal in that he's been brought in to some degree in that he knows Abigail killed one guy. But what he did not know up until this point was that she was an active participant in her fa- in, in her father's killing of young women who looked like her. Not that she did the killing, but she was an active participant in how he moved about and lured these women in. So that's something that Hannibal seems to do now, is put people in compromising positions that they may not be able to get out of because it keeps them from saying the truth. Right. And this is brought about in another way when we get a wonderful sequence in which Jillian Anderson drinks white wine in her kitchen. (laughs) I have a new character trope that I would like to see more of. And that is psychology, women psychologists who love white wine. We have Jillian Anderson here We have Anna Torv and mine Hunter. I want to see this continue. Are there more examples? Do Does the audience know of more examples of women psychologists who love white wine on screen? I want to hear about them. I, I mentioned this on Twitter that I, I think that, you know, that's, a, that's you know, you could just find a gold mine of that in, in your, you know, your, your 90s erotic thrillers. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I, I you know, uh, I do wonder how much of that is going to be covered in um Lines, you know, like blind shadows on people. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm picturing a Kim Basinger and Ellen Barkin. Yeah, just kind of coming home, you know, after talking to their sexy male patient, just who might be a murderer. You know, exhaustedly pouring herself a glass of white wine and Virginia Slim. A lot of tucked in <laughs> blouses that become <laughs> untucked, baby. <laughs> But I have to say, like, it, I'm fully on the Jillian Anderson train. Like, I have been since X-Files. It's not a revelation to me that she's a really good actress. But there's a moment where Jack, just out of, you know, before he's kind of talking in general about Will Graham and stuff forth. But he asks her one thing about Hannibal. Oh, no, he mentions that didn't a, a person attack you in your uh, practice and she has an involuntary shudder that I'm like, Oh my God, that is so good. She is so good in this show. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. She's great at it. I, I late breaking news, Jillian Anderson, great at acting. Very much so. Um, But there's another person whom we learn that Hannibal probably set up that attack to see what would happen. Like this is his courtship. This is his extension of friendship. I will put you in a situation where you might lose your life. And like a jigsaw, if you come out the other side, 
maybe we could be friends. Well, yeah, I, I sort of feel like it's almost like a, a, a sign of respect he offers people. Yeah. Is that I think that you're smart enough to 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 get out of this situation if you really you know, put your mind to it. Yeah. And she did. So now he's like, so you're my psychologist for life. <laughs> Something you pa- she you passed the test. You passed the test. And I'm I I don't know if this is a burden or she is genuinely intrigued by this. I mean, it's gonna become very complicated with her as we go on. And I'm trying not to project what I do know is gonna happen with what I don't remember what will happen. But there's all there's obviously a lot more going on between their relationship, but we can see the pattern established here with a person, you know, a serial killer who doesn't have a lot of friends for obvious reasons, but would still like to be a human being with friends. That is not what I thought Hannibal would have been if you had told me at the onset. Right. And, you know, of course, you've got the whole, you know, brief, glorious run with Franklin, who who desperately <laughs> wanted to be Hannibal's friend. And Hannibal right. was like, yeah, no, nope. no. <laughs> There's no part of this that well, Franklin is not smart enough to be right. Hannibal's friend. And I think he he, he deemed that right from the beginning, and and yeah. you know, no matter how much, and in fact, the more Franklin tried to be his friend, yeah. probably the more put off Hannibal was by him because yes. the whole the whole rudeness thing. Hence, who are the hunters and who are the fishers? And in this sense, Will is a lure. And he he draws Hannibal to him. He doesn't know that, but he is. In the same way, Gillian Anderson is a lure. He's drawn into that relationship and he feels compromised by it and tries to control it. But his relationship to Jack, I think, is different. That's a hunter relationship. He's always trying to camouflage and out track Jack because Jack is infinitely more dangerous to him, I believe. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that he understands, you know, what, what, what Jack is. Right. Um, there's, there's a lot. It's one of those episodes where a lot happens but not a lot happens. It's very, it's a lot more talky for, for, uh, for a penultimate episode than you, than you might expect to be. Although it's got an excellent cliffhanger. Yes. And Abigail's right up into it because now, you know, she kind of dangled the idea that she was a damsel in distress or somebody who needed help. And now she's in a place where she is a damsel in distress and desperately needs help. And the only person around is the Chesapeake Ripper himself. She's really ensnared right up into it with Hannibal Lecter. And this brings up another thing. Do you think that Hannibal's goal was always to frame Will for the copycat murders or by extension, the Chesapeake Ripper murders? Or is that something that simply fell into his well-tailored lap? I I don't know if he thought that far ahead. I think mm-hmm. it just, you know, everything kind of, you know, turning out the way he did was just the way it did was kind of a happy surprise. Right. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that he, I think that he, you know, thought it would definitely cause some trouble for Will or, you know, make things more, more difficult. But I I don't know that he expected to, 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 for it to get to this point. Right. Because I think at the at the onset of this, he's like, well, you think like a serial killer and I am a serial killer. We have so much in common. But now I think he's devised a way for him to continue the relationship where he has an ongoing control. You know, he has his hand on the lever, whereas with Will just being an active participant in the FBI, He's way more, you know, that's too out in the open. It, he's out of pocket, as, as as it were. But if he can frame Will for these murders, which he committed because his brain is on fire, well, 
then he goes away to a mental institution and who can visit him all the time? Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, that that's true. That is true. I you pull a little Harvey Birdman. I'll take the case. <laughs> um so that's that's pretty much where where we've left it. It, it is um uh, it's fun to have something to look forward to in this way even though I do, you know, I remember large portions of where it's going. But also there's so much of it that still genuinely surprises because I like the characters this much. I mean, this show has great involving characters. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, if you can get past the implausibility of a lot of it, mm-hmm. you know, just, just, you know, you know, relax and just go with it. Right. Because basically by the, by the, end, of the, by the end of the show, one of the characters just, you know, is reduced down to like a head in a fishbowl practically. <laughs> Pretty much. Not gonna tell um, you what character it is, but but <laughs> it's it's kind of hilarious after a while. How much <laughs> how much shit this character goes through. Remember the guy in the remake of Evil Dead? Uh, who just the one yes. the one kept getting injured the whole time and each injury <laughs> was like progressively more horrifying. Um yeah, Poochie Taylor? I can't remember. Yes, his first name. that character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's kind of like that. Yeah, he's like just you think, oh, that guy is down and out, and he hobbles back into the room. How much, how much, how much abuse can a body take? <laughs> Turns out a lot. <laughs> oh my, yeah. Um, I saw him. He's doing, um, he's doing some kind of version of uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, and man, he looks good. Not uh, not Poochie Taylor. Oh, uh, uh, Sparks. The other, the other the other guy. Yeah. Yeah. Raul, oh my god. And I'm also thinking. I'm also thinking. We have the 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 in, the, in season three. Mm-hmm. We have the unlikely cast of an incredibly fucking handsome Francis Dollarhide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A character who in the book is described as ugly several times. Yeah. Hotlerhide, I yeah. think, is what we should. <laughs> Is what we should call it. I think <laughs> it's going to take us a while to get the Hotler Hyde, everyone. It's yeah. going to be late into 2021. It's worth it, though, because he's a stone fox. <laughs> Likes to bite them peoples. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. There's so much to look forward to in this. But we, w- we won't get to it until 2021. That's right. The next episode of Dish by Dish will not come out until 2021. Uh, the first day of it so you won't have to wait long and then we're gonna we're, we're probably gonna have to take a, a little bit of a break uh in recording just the catch up um we may be dropping some other special things but uh then we'll be back into it in very early spring uh so never fear the body count will continue for myself and for gina goodbye everybody bye bye